Okay, good morning and thank you for logging into our webinar on abandoned goods left on common property. Unfortunately, COVID is still running rampant and interfering with our ability to hold face-to-face -face seminars, but hopefully we'll be back on track to host you in our office for the next one. Today, we will look at the legal framework as to how owners corporations can dispose of goods left on common property, particularly now that the Owners Corporation Act has amended to include has been amended rather to include the process to be followed. Haley Tran from Inner RE will provide some insight as to how property managers deal with goods left behind by outgoing tenants. And Kevin Tan from Clean As You Go will present on the process to remove hard rubbish from common property. Also, we have a chat box function, so please feel free to type in any questions as we go and we'll address them towards the end. So let's get started by looking at the provisions in the Owners' Corporation Act that came into effect on 1 December last year. So the amendments to the Owners Corporation Act included new Division 5A, uh, Div yeah. and the first section is Section 53A, which provides that disposal must be in accordance with Division 5A of the Owners Corp Act. In addition to that, Sections 60 to 65 and 73 to 76 of the Australian Consumer Law and Fair Trading Act of 2012 also apply to the disposal of abandoned goods by an owner's corporation and reference to uncollected goods is to be read as though it were a reference to abandoned goods. Reference to the receiver is to be read as though it were a reference to the owner's corporation and a reference to the provider is to be read as though it were a reference to the person who abandoned the goods. Okay. Firstly, the OC must provide a written notice of its intention to dispose of the goods to the person who left the goods on common property and any person with a registered interest in the goods. So that might be the mortgagee of a car or some other motor vehicle. Notice may be given to the person personally, hand delivered, or posted to their last known address. A person with a publicly registered interest in the abandoned goods is deemed to have been given notice if the notice was sent by post to their address registered uh, in the register with the interest, uh, such as the PPSR. And as I was saying before, that could be someone that's got a mortgage over the car or motorbike. The OC must also make reasonable attempts to notify the owner of its intention to dispose of the goods if not collected. Before disposing of the goods, the owner's corporation may move them to a safe place if they block reasonable access to a lot or the common property and the OC has made a reasonable attempt to locate or communicate with the person who abandoned the goods of its in notice of intention to dispose of them. Having said that, though, sending a notice on a Monday and removing the goods on a Wednesday is not classified as a reasonable attempt. So you, you need to be able to try and get hold of the owner. So. There's no law on this, but perhaps one or two weeks, but definitely not one or two days. Furthermore, 
the OC must not dispose of the goods if a dispute in relation to the goods exists between the person who abandoned the goods and the OC and an application in relation to the dispute has been made to VCAP by the OC. So we have no current case law on this, but with the introduction of these new provisions, I say watch this space because we may end up having cases that we can talk about. Um, Additionally, an OC must not dispose, uh, an OC that disposes of goods under this division is not liable in relation to the goods by reason of the disposal. So this means that if the owner's corporation follows the provisions under Division 5A, they will not be held liable for getting rid of the items if somebody comes out of the woodworks after. In addition to the provisions under the Owners' Corporation Act, I thought I would go through over the provisions in the Australian Consumer Law and Fair Trading Act, which take the process required to dispose of abandoned goods one step further. So in terms of notice and disposal, where an owner has been located, the owner's corporation can dispose of the goods 28 days after the notice was given if hand delivered or given personally. If the notice was given by ordinary prepaid post, we say 28 days plus seven business days because that will allow for the owner or the person who's um, been given the notice to receive it through the post. Where the owner has been identified but has not been located, the OC must wait 60 days before it can dispose of low value items, 90 days before it can dispose of medium value items and 180 days for high value items. I've also prepared a table for the method of disposal. So for low value items, we've got motor vehicles and other items and the method. So for a motor vehicle less than a thousand or other items less than $200, the OC can dispose of the goods by sale or destruction. For a medium value item, not including a motor vehicle, which is equal to 200 but less than 5,000, the OC can either dispose of the goods by private auction or private sale. And for high value motor vehicles more than or equal to $1,000 or other items more than or equal to $5,000, the OC can dispose of them either by public auction where the owner cannot be located or private sale where the owner has been located. Also with respect to perishable goods of any value, the OC can dispose of them either by sale, appropriation or destruction. With respect to high value motor vehicles, the owner's corporation must not dispose of it unless it has first obtained a written search result of the PPSR. The penalty for non-compliance is 120 penalty units. Currently, the value of one penalty unit is $184.92. So 120 penalty units is $22,190 and 40 cents. So it's very, very important that the owner's corporation complies with section 63 because there could be a significant penalty to be paid. Additionally, the OC may apply to Vic Roads for a certificate which sets out the details of the registered owner. The application must be in the form of a stat deck and must include the owner's corporation's details, the vehicle's registration number if available and the vehicle identification number, a copy of the notice of intention to dispose of the vehicle or a copy of the application filed in VCAT, a copy of the PPSR search result and any other prescribed information. Essentially VCAT, um, sorry, Vic Roads will not provide that information unless the OC can provide details to show that there is an abandoned vehicle and the OC has taken steps before it disposes of it. The owner's corporation may also apply to a court or VCAT for an order to dispose of the abandoned goods, and the application must provide the grounds on which it's made, 
the information outlined in the Notice of Intention and a read and search result of the PPSR or Vic Road Certificates for Motor Vehicles. A copy of the application must be given to an owner if they can be located after reasonable inquiries have been made, any person with a publicly registered interest in the goods and any other person known by the OC to have or to be claiming an interest in the goods. Um, the court can make orders authorising the disposal of abandoned goods, specifying the authorised means of disposal, the date by which they may be disposed, the amount of the relevant charge payable to the OC for the goods, orders determining the relevant charge payable to the OC, and any other orders that it considers necessary to give effect to orders authorising the disposal. Once the goods have been sold, the OC may retain as reimbursement any out-of-pocket expenses. The remainder of the funds, if there's anything left, must be treated as unclaimed money pursuant to the Unclaimed Money Act, if not returned to the owner of the abandoned goods. The out-of-pocket expenses, if they are more than the sale price, the OC may pursue recovery action against the owner for the shortfall and that would just be an application to VCAP. Once the goods have been sold, within seven days, the OC must record and keep for a period of six years details about the goods sold and details of the sale. Those records may be inspected by the person who left the goods or vehicle, the owner of the goods or vehicle, if that is different to the person that left them, and anyone else claiming to have a proprietary or security interest in the goods. Penalty for non-compliance is 50 penalty units in the case of a body corporate or an owner's corporation in this case. The OC must also provide the purchaser of the motor vehicle a receipt signed by both parties, detailing again the OC's details, the vehicle's last registration number and vehicle identification number, Purchases details, the date of sale, sale price, the name of the owner of the vehicle and any other prescribed information. And again, the penalty for non-compliance is 50 penalty units in the case of an owner's corporation. Okay, so our next speaker with the background in customer service, Haley Tran thrives on face-to-face -face communication and the fast-paced environment of real estate. She joined Inner RE in 2016 as the receptionist and has worked her way all the way up to property manager. Exceptional communication is crucial in Haley's day-to-day -day work of managing renters and landlords. Also, outside of work, Haley is an amateur baker. She loves KitchenAid, and we're told that she makes the best cookies in the Southeast. Please welcome Haley. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Deborah, for giving Inner Real Estate the opportunity to present today. Um, so there's been changes um, to the rental laws from 29th of March, 2021, regarding schools left behind. Consumer affairs used to go out to the properties when we asked them to, to determine whether or not the goods abandoned at the property are, could be disposed of. However, they are now no longer coming out. The rental provider will now need to store the goods for 14 days and then dispose of it thereafter. So the responsibilities, there are a series of steps rental providers must follow when goods are left behind in rental premises. There are goods that can be disposed of immediately if it holds no monetary value. So for example, food, um, dangerous goods, they can be thrown off immediately. Goods left behind which cannot be disposed of immediately, the rental provider must store it in a same place for at least 14 days or even 90 days. For 14 days, 
are goods to be sold. So like specialised medical devices or equipment, medals or trophies, and or general appliances like white goods, TVs, furniture. Um, the rental provider must use the notice of goods left behind to inform the renter about the goods and give the renter the opportunity to reclaim the goods as well. So the, this is the consumer affair form that the rental provider must fill out. So on there, it does say like the date that you are serving the rental provider, the notice, where the abandoned goods have been left and what kind of items have been left behind as well. On there as well, you, can, you need to specify the 14 days that the renter has until to collect the items. And then after that, you can dispose of it. You do have a few options as well in terms of delivery methods of the notice as well. So it could be by registered post, prepaid post and or electronic email as well. The 14 days start from the day the rental provider first informs the renter of the goods left behind. If the renter responds within the 14 days and advises that they require an extension to reclaim the goods, they will need to apply to VCAP for extension and for VCAP to approve that as well. So recently, we had a property out in South Bank. The tenant had abandoned the property. Thankfully, a couple of days after, one of their friends had come in contact with us, advising that they are needing access to the property to remove valuable belongings. Um, once the valuables were removed, the goods were stored inside the apartment for up to 14 days. Now, the reason why the goods were stored behind in the apartment for 14 days was because the property was damaged and there were works that needed to be completed. So the rental provider could not lease, re let it out straight away. We advised the tenant that if they required access, they could contact us and we'll go to the property and open that for them. We've also advised building management that the property had been abandoned. So if anyone contacts building management asking them to provide access to that particular apartment, building management needed to contact us straight away. In a normal situation where the property could be let straight away, the rental provider and the agency will then remove the goods left behind into a storage unit and keep it there for the rental for 14 days. There are items as well that needs to be stored for 90 days. Now, these kind of items comes to personal documents, photography and or materials on computer hard drive. Um, if the rental provider does not comply to these laws, the documents can be disposed of after. Um, so selling, selling or getting rid of the goods, after the storing of goods for 14 days and the agreed time frame with the renter, the renter and the renter does not reclaim the goods left behind. The renter, the rental provider can either sell or dispose of the goods. We generally recommend to the rental provider to dispose of the goods that are left behind um, rather than trying to sell it off and trying to make profit from it. If the rental provider wishes to resell some of the goods left behind, such as white goods, TVs, or furniture, the renter does have up until six months to reclaim the money made from the sale. If the renter does not reclaim any of the money made from the sale, the rental provider must then pay the money made from the sale into a residential tenancy fund. So like the property back in South Bank, we had given the renter 14 days to return back to remove more of their valuables if they're required. From there, they advised us that whatever was left behind in the apartment was no longer of value to them. Um, we did arrange with building management as well to try and remove the goods out of the apartment after the 14 days and advise them, and they asked them, we asked them um, when hard, hard rubbish collection was, and if there was no hard rubbish for that particular complex, we then took it to the tip. So um, it is reasonable for rental providers to seek an occupational fee from the renter to store the goods or move the goods left behind. The occupational fee is treated like a reletting fee for the property um, as the goods left behind were either too, in a, too large of a quantity or too large for a storage to be put into a storage um, unit. The occupational fee must not be more than 14 days of the renter 
the renter who would have paid the goods being left behind in the apartment. This will then total 14 days. If VCAT had ordered the goods to be stored for more days, then the occupational fee must equal the number of days that VCAT had ordered. Um, so both... So both rental provider and renter can apply to VCAT for compensation. Now, the rental provider can apply to VCAT for compensation if the tenant does not pay the occupational fee or any fees that were involved in having the goods removed from their property and into a storage unit. The renter can also apply to VCAT for compensation if the, if the series of steps the rental provider had not followed and also if in the meantime when the goods were stored, it was not stored in a safe place and that the items were damaged. That's it for today. Thank you. Thanks, Haley. Our final speaker, Kevin Tan, excels in delivering innovation and client solutions with 17 years of experience in corporate and client partnerships with billion dollar clients. Kevin has extensive experience delivering solutions in complex environments including areas in Asia, Central Asia, and Africa. He also designs and delivers FM solutions to hundreds of owners' corporations in Victoria. Kevin spent over 18 years in development and aid across Asia, Central Asia, and Africa, establishing several projects and partners who still operate today to help thousands a year. Clean As You Go is a business which supports these projects. Please welcome Kevin. Great, thank you. Thank you, Deb, uh, for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, never in a million years I thought I'd do a presentation on hard rubbish and that there'd be an audience that wants to hear about that. So good on you for participating in this today. Uh, thank you for waking up early and, and hearing us uh, talk about this. So yes, I'm from Clean As You Go. Um, I see some participants here that I recognize, so welcome. Uh, it's great to see you guys. Uh, I see Miranda and Serena, hi, good to see you. So I guess I, I, guess I see some OC managers here as well, so welcome on board. Um, yes, we are clean as you go. Uh, we work in a lot of buildings, so away we go. All right, hold on, I'm just moving slides. Let's see. Okay, so hard rubbish. Um, now, so that you know that I know what I'm talking about and that we're all on the same page, I'm just going to show you a few photos of what I'm talking about. Okay, so that's hard rubbish in the apartment uh, sites that we look after. Here you are, some examples. It gets even better. Yeah, there's even more there. stuff dumped on the side of the road. This, this is usually what happens more often than not, uh, hard rubbish being dumped in the bin room, which is also a, an OH&S issue um, because bins cannot be moved around and they can become a trip hazard. Uh, so this is something that uh, OC managers and OC committees need to be wary about. Uh, this just more rubbish being dumped outside in the property. Again, uh, it becomes an issue when it's dumped around a car park because cars can hit it, uh, damage different other properties. Uh, this is a storeroom full of junk that has built up over the years and no one wants to get rid of it or pay for it. So it just accumulates more and more. So. I'm sure some of you have seen that before. Here's another example of another storeroom being filled up with a whole heap of stuff that people abandoned. Now, it's funny enough because when I when I listen to Deb and I listen to Haley, we don't have an issue trying to figure out whether they want it or not. Uh, most of the time when we find it, more often than not, they're trying to get us to pay for, uh, well, the OC to pay for the getting rid of these rubbish. So um, that's normally what happens in our in, in on the ground where we are. Uh, this is another example of people moving in and out of apartments. Um, they, 
and oftentimes this happens in new builds uh, where people are moving in, they bought their new TVs, they bought their new uh, furniture uh, from Ikea, there's a whole heap of boxes and they just leave it uh, around because it can't fit into any box, uh, any of the bins. So this is another example of that. Uh, more rubbish uh, next to the bin room, again, stored next to a car park area. So again, very dangerous, uh, needs to be get rid of. And this is, mind you, um, most of the time over a weekend that this accumulates. So what, th what you see here happened over Saturday and Sunday. So and this is an apartment of where there's 200 different uh, lots. So it gets pretty extreme. Uh, and we had to get rid of that uh, in the next day uh, be before it became even worse. So there's some examples. Um, apparently I can't mute anyone, but I want to be able to keep this a bit more interactive since you woke up early to talk about hard rubbish. Can people in the chat write down what is the worst thing you've seen in your property or properties if you're OC manager as to what you've had to get rid of? If you can top anything that I've, uh, I've put out there, please. Please let me know. Are you guys away? Can you, can you write in the chat to see what what uh, what you have seen as the worst thing you're going to have to get rid of? While you do that, I'll just keep on going. All right. The, 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 the prize for the worst thing that's ever been left, I'll come out to your property and I'll try to solve your hard rubbish problem. Okay, I'll put a solution together for you. All right, All right next. So the process of removal. Um, this is something we go through almost every day uh, because there's hard rubbish and often over the weekend, a lot of hard rubbish accumulates. Uh, so the first thing, I guess, as an OC committee member, if you are an OC committee member uh, or resident in the building, uh, is to work out who to report to, yeah, who to report to. So the first um, and most likely person you're going to report to is the OC manager who who would know about what, what the process is for that building. Uh, the next, if you're a building that's big enough um, to have a building manager, you can report it to the building manager and they will then have their own process to go through as well. Uh, or next, if you don't have um, a direct line to the OC manager or you don't have a building manager, then it would be the cleaner or the caretaker, uh, which is oftentimes uh, who we are on site. Uh, when when we clean sites, we will report hard rubbish and we report it straight to the OC manager as well and take photos. So one of the things that's important as an OC committee member or resident on site is to always take photos of where it has been dumped because there's evidence as to where um, it lies, whether it's in common property or whether it's in private property, uh, and then a date and time for uh, when that was dumped as well. And then you can send it to either the building manager or the OC manager um, so that's the first thing to report. The second thing to try to work out is the responsibility. As I mentioned before, um, we have to work out whether it is in common property or whether it's in a private lot. So oftentimes there might be uh, abandoned goods that is left in a car park. And a car park is actually considered private lot. So there's nothing really what we can do about that um, unless we approach the private um, lot owner and, and ask them to remove certain things, but that is considered a private lot. But if it is in common property, either bin room or left outside in the, um, the yard or uh, even in a hallway sometimes it's been left in, uh, then that's, that's, that's likely going to be an OC issue to deal with. Okay. So um, one thing that we as cleans you go do because OC managers don't often get the opportunity to go on site. Uh, us as cleaners or area managers, we will send out someone to go inspect uh, what is going on in there uh, and we'll do a site audit. Um, possibly if there is CCTV, we will grab um, an image of who dumped that and then we can track it all the way down to which, uh, which apartment that came from. Uh, that's just to identify who has actually dumped that rubbish. And then um, we will place that hard rubbish in an appropriate location where it doesn't become an OHS issue. Uh, next, the third thing would be collection. Trying to work out exactly what the solution is in terms of how to get rid of it. Now, every OC works a bit differently. 
Um, every site has its own different process. Uh, sometimes there's an agreement with the council uh, to actually get rid of it. And so you can put it on the side of the road. As I understand it, every apartment has uh, two times a year where they can put up rubbish and then you know uh, that, that can be collected on the side of the road. And I'll talk a bit more about um, what council will, will accept and won't accept. Okay, next. If, if the council, if there's no agreement with the council to be able to dump rubbish on the side of the road, um, then often it will be the waste contractor or the cleaner that, that cleans that up. So for waste contractor, it could be someone like WasteWise or uh, Urban Waste or Bin Boys, there's a number of them that I'm sure you guys use. Um, oftentimes you can, you can work a deal out with them uh, to, for the removal of hard rubbish. This will not be done in the regular, uh, waste removal this will have to be something that is reported and then they collect it as well so but this is something that has to be pre-arranged with the waste contractor because oftentimes they will just ignore hard rubbish so it's something that has to be pre-arranged with the waste contractor now if either of those two options are not available for your oc uh, then oftentimes this is where we we come in and as cleaners or caretakers we would uh, arrange for hard rubbish pickup. So there'll be an individual truck that comes out uh, and collects all the hard rubbish and then takes it to um, a waste site to be dumped. Uh, now that comes to the fourth point, uh, which is invoicing. Now who pays for that is gonna be up to the OC manager to try to work out if it's the uh, private lot owner or it's gonna be the owner's corporation that foots the bill for that. And oftentimes the owner's corporation does foot the bill and it goes to everyone, which is unfair. Uh, but if you can't track down who dumped the rubbish, then that's um, that's one of the issues there. So now pricing. Um, pricing, again, depends on which area of the city you are in. Uh, but normally collection, uh, the minimum uh, charge is about $200 per cubic meter. Okay, that's $200 per cubic meter to pick up. Um, and then there's tipping fees on top of that. Now, tip fees depends on, again, how big the load is, uh, but it normally ranges about $150 to $450. It could be more than that, depending on how big the load is, but often it doesn't get that big because um, if it does get that big, it means that it's been um, accumulating for a long time. Okay, uh, next is future proofing, which is probably uh, the most important thing to try to get done. Uh, if you have a hard rubbish issue in your property. Um, so how do we minimize future hard rubbish? Well, there's a few, there's a few things in, in clean, as clean as you go, we, we manage hundreds of properties. Uh, so these are a few of the ways that we've gone about it to try to minimize um, the future dumping of hard rubbish. One is process. If your building is big enough, um, we're able to build in a process where residents are told a procedure of when to dump hard rubbish so for example we have a site in croydon uh, where they basically put the rubbish out on the nature strip themselves and then we will then uh, take pictures of that and then call the council uh, for them to be able to collect that uh, so we have an arrangement with the council and they are happy for us to be able to do that so basically this nature strip is filled with rubbish most of the time because it's there is a lot of residents on that property and they keep on dumping rubbish out there. So that was the only way we could do it there. Uh, in another property in St. Kilda, uh, this is an apartment block. So there isn't much space to be able to just dump rubbish on the side of the road. So we have a with an area within the apartment block where we've just marked it out as a hard rubbish spot to, to dump. They are allowed to put their hard rubbish there uh, within a week period uh, every month. So we give them notice of when that time starts and then they can start dumping their rubbish there. And by the end of that week, we will take it to the side of the, um, uh, the nature strip and then that will be collected by the council. So there are different ways, uh, processes that you can put in place where there is a bit more of a system uh, so that the hard rubbish doesn't accumulate. Uh, if that is not possible and the OC doesn't wanna deal with hard rubbish at all, Another way is to create signage and communicate that with the rest of the residents. Um, and I'll show you an example of signage uh, that we've created before in another apartment, uh, which basically tells them that hard rubbish is not to be dumped on the property. And if uh, they are found out, then we have CCTV in this, in this particular building. Um, we will track it down and they would have to pay the cost of uh, us getting rid of the 
uh, hard rubbish. So that's that's another way we can do it. So basically a bit of a fine. And what happened in that instance is um, the hard rubbish problem almost disappeared uh, overnight because uh, they realized that we were on top of it. And um, everyone that dumped got a notice and everyone a breach notice as well as um, uh, a potential fine. And when they found out about the fine, they removed the rubbish themselves. So that, that worked out quite well for this apartment that had about 200 uh, different apartments in it. So that's basically the process of getting rid of um, hard rubbish. Now, let me see whether, oh, I can't go back to my uh, chat. Where's the chat? I've lost the chat, so I can't see your results. Anyway, all right. So what is hard rubbish? So this is what council will collect and what council will not collect. Uh, you can look this up online. Um, basically, this is one of the councils uh, that says that, you know, you can't dump tree roots, branches, big materials, basically big building materials. You can't dump on the side of the road, commercial materials, um, you know, construction materials. You can't dump on the side of the road. Uh, one thing that most people don't know is that you can't dump polystyrene or styrofoam on the side of the road as well uh, for hard rubbish collection. Um, or car bodies or whole or dismantled car bodies, you can't do that. So there's, there's a whole list there and I can send, you know, you'll get this PowerPoint so you can um, see that more. Next, this is an example of tip fees. This is just from Burundara. Um, different types of hard rubbish that can be dumped in different sizes of the trailers and how they will charge you for that. Okay, so every council will have different ways of doing it, but uh, this is just an example from Burundara. And the next one is example signage that uh, work quite well. So it's, uh, we have this all over the apartment and especially where people usually dump the rubbish, we have this blown up in A3 size. So it says no hard waste dumping, notice all residents uh, where to put rubbish, you know, red bins, yellow bins and e-waste bins. Uh, and then in red, we have, it is a responsibility of all residents um, to get rid of their own rubbish. And if not, uh, we will uh, issue them a breach notice and any charges for disposal will be put onto them. So this worked very well in one of the buildings that we work in. Um, and that's it. So yeah, again, we are, we are facility managers in a lot of, in over hundred uh, different properties with building managers, concierge and cleaning services. Uh, one thing that some people don't know about what we do is that we're a purpose-driven company. So every building we service uh, translates to profits going to projects that I used to work in, uh, in Africa, Central Asia, Asia, where we, um, su uh, we support projects that are in economic empowerment, water, sanitation, human trafficking, and education. And this is one of the projects that we support in Laos. Um, this is a water well that we built there so that they have access to water so they don't have to walk for miles um, because sometimes when the children do that, there's a lot of human trafficking that happens in this area. So yeah, this is one of the projects. So again, thank you so much for your time. I hope that was uh, insightful. Um, if you need help with your property, let us know. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, Kevin. Did we have any questions? I'm not very savvy with this chat function. Nope, can't see any questions, but if any questions do, come up, please feel free to reach out to the three of us. You'll um, receive a copy of our PowerPoint presentations and our contact details. And we're, we'll all be more than happy to assist where we can. Thanks again for logging in and we'll see you at the next one.